Okay. May I start? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to GRIPS Forum. Uh, my name is Izumi Ono. Uh, I teach international development policy here at the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies based in Tokyo, GRIPS. I will be serving your host today. Today, we are very honored and pleased to invite a special guest from Taiwan, the country's digital minister, Audrey Tan. Here, the screen. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity for all of us to learn Taiwan's experiences of creating open and inclusive societies with digitalization, which can be called as Taiwan model of democracy. We want to think together what each of our country and society should do and how we can contribute to making the world better as envisaged under the SDG. I also thank you so much for the strong interest and participation with Many, many audience, I think a 500 people capacity has been fully reached registering today. It's the largest group forum we have ever had. So hi, Audrey. <laughs> Thank you for joining today. Hello, good local time, yeah. everyone. It's wonderful. Yeah, we are so appreciate your spending important, precious time. So let me briefly introduce uh, the Audrey's uh, profile. Okay. Okay. So um, Minister Audrey Tan, is a best known as a central figure of mobilizing digital power to protect the citizens from COVID pandemic, to advance social innovation and democracy. In 2016, she became Taiwan's youngest ever minister at the age of 35. She's incredible genius and self-educated. So she began programming work in Taiwan at the age of 15 and then started her own IT company at the age of uh, the, the seven, nine, 19 at the Silicon Valley, so successfully. She also advised uh, Apple on the high-level AI artificial intelligence project. Before assuming the ministerial position under the current Tsai Ing-wen administration, she was also active in civic tech community called GovZero, which proposed to rethink the government role from Zero by using digital technology to change the traditional way of policy making. What is really wonderful uh, is that she has committed to using her digital skill and intelligence to create open government, which is transparent, accountable, participatory, and inclusive for the whole society and citizens and the world. Okay, so how Minister Audrey Town has been engaged in this admirable task and how is the Taiwan government functioning as to the maximize the benefit of digital power for creating open and inclusive societies? These are questions we want to think together with a discussion with Minister Tang. And such questions are very much relevant for all of us, whichever the country and organization you are from. This is also timely for Japan, since the digital agency will be established in September in two months ahead. So there's a lot to learn from Taiwan's model of democracy. Okay, so let me briefly uh, talk about what is a trade program is. Minister Audrey Tan has kindly agreed to make this forum very interactive with the audience, including with students as a future leaders. So I plan to organize three sessions as follows. The first session, maybe very short session, about 15 minutes, uh, I will make a brief introduction of her uh, achievement and the innovative measures, and also have a few conversations based on that the pre-selected uh, that the question from that the group students. Then second session will be about forty minutes. Uh, we will be a panel discussion with six group students from various countries who will directly interact with Minister Audrey Tan. Lastly, uh, we have a Q and session, uh, maybe fifteen minutes or so, uh, for the floor so that uh, you can also make a comment and question by raising that, that fundraise function. Okay, so let me start with the uh, first uh, the session. Okay, so let me share the screen first, just a few minutes. Okay. 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 So, um, this is the, the first example, it's a very famous example, uh, fight against COVID with innovative measures. 
It is a typical example of her digital social innovation. Together with the IT expert, that she created an application to show face mask inventory and location at a glance, so that the people can know where to buy masks and get them fairly. And also more recently, uh, she has just prepared this application for a nationwide vaccine booking platform to indicate where people can get vaccine shots safely and effectively, such as hospitals, clinics, public and private facilities. I think from July 4th, uh, this is made available. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. She may be explaining later more in detail. And then this is public digital innovation space, uh, PDIS, the her office. Okay. So Audrey gives a lot of importance to open government and also working with social entrepreneurs and also working with the young, young people. Okay. And just, so this PDIS hosts collaborative meetings to collect voices from various people, including minority people. So here is the maybe example, this family is uh, talking to the Audrey Tang uh, for some family affairs or some questions or consultation, but appointment is open to everybody. And then those meeting records are shown transparently in the PDIS at that platform. This is another example of PDIS function. It is online public policy participation platform. So people can submit the proposal through online platform. And then with more than 5,000 petition signatories, then uh, Taiwanese government is required to start thinking about seriously how to make this proposal put into action. Okay. So that discussion session, what is situated, so those things process can be also monitored. This is an example, uh, for example, increased passengers free facilities as a proposal. Then a petition has been made and you will know where the status is, how many people are endorsing it, and then when the government will be responding. So this is a kind of very user-friendly participatory platform. Then once uh, the, the particular policy is adopted, it is also possible for the citizen to see how the implementation process is. So visualization executive process is also important. Uh, this is a diagram uh, what uh, I have created based on my understanding how that the Taiwanese government uh, that, uh, that works with Minister Audrey Tang. So president appoint a prime minister, then a prime minister as a CEO that uh, managed that the executive branch appointing 32 ministers, ministers and also head of council. And Minister Audrey Tang is a minister with a portfolio in charge of the digital sector, a uh, cross-cutting way. Very much impressive thing that the Minister Tang has created a space to communicate with citizens and also allow citizen participation interaction with a public policy making process. This public digital innovation space, PDIS, is just as, as explained, a social innovation lab. She has an office hour every Wednesday to meet with social entrepreneurs to get their ideas and also uh, that, that, that civic tech solution uh, to, 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 to make available. There are also reverse mentoring for the young people, around 30 people age, uh, are invited to be an advisor to each ministry, to the ministers. Then also each minister uh, is uh, required to an appoint participation officer uh, who is responsible for talking to the government's policy, ministry's policies, and so getting feedback from the citizens and then uh, consulting what can be done better. And then they also work closely with PDIS office. So citizen has been brought in this space. Then outside the government, the, the civic tech society has been very much active, like Dub Zero, which I mentioned, and then Minister Tang, came from these communities. So there are various mechanisms within government to allow citizen participation and fostering mutual trust. This is digitalization with warm power is a strong belief as I understand that the Minister Tam. She encouraged that the, 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 we don't have to worry about the weakness. This is a kind of that the favorite, her favorite lyrics uh, by, by the Canadian singer, singer songwriter, Leonardo Cohen. Uh, we don't have to be a perfect. Uh, there is a crack 
in everything, but this is how light gets in to make the world brighter. In other words, in the other words, it is okay for the government has some deficiencies, but this is an opportunity rather to find out that uh, the issues, how to improve working together with the citizens. So it's a quite positive thinking, and then government citizens work together for co-creating solution. Last few slides is that um, um, the annual hackathon event is hosted by the president, and then she's a quite important figure here. And here, a Ministry of uh, that, uh, Economy and uh, Economic Affairs, uh, together with SME agency, has been inviting that the SME people and also that the, the, the entrepreneur to solve that, that with their, their technology with a problem. And then she is also active globally and also domestically to work with the young people to promote this uh, the social innovation toward achieving SDG. So this is the end of my quick overview, and I hope that the, my uh, understanding is correct. If not correct, order it, please, uh, that they correct it, okay? <laughs> okay. So uh, based on that, uh, I have three top questions that are selected by GRIP students. So let me share with you. Okay. First question, Audrey, is as follows. How can we overcome digital divide? and create an inclusive and democratic system because there are elderly people or remote areas people who may have a difficulty in access digital technology. How do you do it? Thank you. Um, really happy to be here. Uh, and I think one of the main ideas as the digital minister, not the minister for IT, uh, is this idea that digitalization is about connecting people while IT is more about connecting machines. And therefore in digital services, we are bringing technology to where people are. We're not asking people to adapt to where technologists are. So the idea of participatory design, where very old people, including my own grandmother, 88 years old, and her younger friends of 77 years old, are invited in the co-creation of digital services related to the daily affairs. One example is the mask rationing uh, application. It was developed around a year and a half ago. And I consulted uh, my grandma and her uh, more younger uh, friends in their 70s. Uh, and instead of the, our original design, which is in the convenience store using the automated teller machines, the ATM, uh, to install your debit card, to uh, press a key, to wire uh, the mask. Uh, purchasing money, uh, a few dollars, um, into the Center for Disease Control in return of the receipt from the ATM. And you can use that receipt next week to collect the rationed mask uh, and then use the same ATM to renew uh, or even do a recurring subscription. It sounds like a great design, uh, but my grandma and her friends said, if I do this design, they will go back and queue in line in pharmacy to mm -hmm. buy a mask mm -hmm. because they are afraid of entering passwords. Yeah, yeah. They're afraid that people queuing be, uh, after them will see their password. They're afraid if they press one extra zero, they will wire 10 times the money out uh, to the CDC. And these are not unreasonable fears. These are true and real uh, issues. So if we push and force them to use mobile payment or ATM, our most important metric, which is to get uh, the mask availability to as many older people as possible will fail. So uh, I instead asked, so if you are the digital minister, what would you do? And then uh, my grandma's younger friend in her 70s said, uh, well, when I queue in line in the pharmacy, I use my national health card. I don't have to remember a password. I just insert it into the machine and out goes the mask rationing. The pharmacist helped me through the entire process. What if I can use the national health card at a kiosk of the convenience store machine? Because I don't enter password. It doesn't matter that a kiosk is an open place instead of an AP ATM, which has a protecting screen. Uh, I don't insert uh, the card to uh, type password. I just uh, insert the card to get the receipt, right? And I take the receipt to the counter to pay in coins. 
because I will take exactly this number of around two US dollars with me. I know for sure that I will not mistakenly wire out money that I didn't intend to pay. And that makes them feel safer. So I think to reduce the risk that is to this, to make the elderly feel safer is the most important point. And once they learn that this is a safe space, they will take care of teaching the 66 years old and so on. Uh, and so they become uh, our advocates, our evangelists of nice. this better experience. So working with as old as possible, like 90s, that's even better. Uh, and they will make sure that this uh, safety and this experience of lower risk and saving time will be transmitted to their um, you know, children and so on in the 70s age. I see, thank you so much. So that in the design stage, the kind of the preference or comfort of the different stakeholders, including yes. elderly people, are embedded. And this is one of the reasons why you chose to use the National Health Insurance System in the mask mm -hmm. application. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you very much. Uh, the second question is that because that our students, uh, many students are coming from the various developing countries, and they are wondering, how can the public sector increase the, this ICT capabilities? Because that the e-government is important, but uh, can we train the existing official or outsource IT engineers? And what kind of service maybe a provision model is available, uh, ready-made, or we should be using much more tailor-made? So those are questions raised by our students. Um, there is not a forced choice in Taiwan between ready-made and tailor-made. If you use open source technologies, then it's both ready-made and tailor-made. Open source means that the authors relinquish part of their copyright. So they will not sue you if you decide to host the software on your own computer. That is to say, if you like the experience of using, for example, uh, the Firefox browser, but because it's open source, you can change it to develop extensions that are tailor-made to your needs. For example, I use an extension called Facebook Feed Eradicator to take away the Facebook feed completely and replace it with a uh, like such saying and so on. So I don't get distracted at all. I use Facebook like a blog. So this is both ready-made as a browser and tailor-made as extensions. I so I would suggest to use as much as possible free and open software that are mature and well adopted and then you can tailor made that to your local preference i see i see but but but, but for that they need that, that the people who are really understand that, that how how those system works not least that the several cater of the people are needed yeah yes so okay. i will suggest make it part of your basic education mm -hmm. in basic education when learning digital competence Many people now use open source tools such as, well, uh, the Arduino uh, open hardware uh, kit uh, or working with the Wikipedia or OpenStreetMap community or Raspberry Pi uh, or MIT Scratch and so on. So these are all very welcoming communities. So instead of the teacher having to hold the standardized answers, the students can immediately reach to a global community who can serve as mentors to these young people. And once they get uh, um, more involved in the architecture level of software, then they become your future partners in designing the digital services for the public sector. I myself have published textbooks uh, a few years ago called Architecture of Open Source Applications or AOSA that teaches the young students. And this is also a free book, uh, free of copyrights. You're free to also share it. I see, thank you very much. Yeah, the, from my side, last question very quickly. Um, the government is often vertically, you know, that's for it, and also with a sometimes vested interest. So how and why can Taiwanese government that the reflect citizen voices so quickly to the public policy? No resistance at all? Uh, well, we are the resistance, right? <laughs> so re remember back in 2014, we occupied the parliament, the legislature yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, for, yeah. for three Sunflower, weeks. Yes. Yeah, the Sunflower Movement. Sunflower movement. So, yes. so we are the resistance. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, and so the, the point I'm making is that 
when we occupy the parliament, it's not a demonstration like a protest. It's a demonstration like a demo. A demo in the software world means we are showing people a proof of concept that does something better. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we occupy the parliament working with the 20 or so non-government organizations, we showed that it's not just about broadcasting of mm -hmm. televisions and radio, because that's about speaking to millions of people. If you flip this around using the Internet, using live streaming and many other technologies, you can listen to millions of people concurrently, mm -hmm. just as now we are using a software to listen to each other and also 500 other people. So this is one possibility to get people to care about something that's not happening in their neighborhood. It is to get a virtual neighborhood, like a digital public square. And back in 2014, we developed this concept of digital public infrastructure where people can listen to one another constructively on social objects, such as the petitions and the budgets that you showed in your initial slides. So my suggestion is instead of thinking it as a public sector or private sector thing, Think of it as a social sector thing, as a what I call people, public, private partnership, because we are all voluntary citizens in these pro-social civic spaces. And when we co-create something new there, it is free for all to use, including private sector and public sector. So instead of thinking uh, we need to work across the silos in the government, we yeah. just encourage each oh, ministry see to publish open data, publish open API, do their crowdsourcing and crowdfunding even events. And then the public servants from the next ministry may actually just be a citizen participant in those open spaces. That's my answer. I see, I see. So you try to bring the public sector to the citizen space too. Yeah, I see. Exactly, yes. yeah. Because they are also citizens when they're off work. I see, I see. And then they feel like everybody's watching. So they feel like they have to do something together. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Then uh, I maybe I should not monopolize the precious time with you. We have a student keen to have an interaction with you. So uh, let me uh, the, go to the uh, discussion session with the students um, the, for the panel discussion. Uh, so could you, yeah. I would like to invite six group students from now. Okay, can we show that their face? And also before that, let me uh, explain that, that today, uh, due to the uh, Minister Tan's uh, the, the commitment, we will be finishing GRIP's forum itself, entire forum at 6 p.m. And she will be leaving uh, the five minutes before uh, the six. So we will have a wrap up afterwards, but uh, please uh, Apollo, uh, that accept this and I will try to uh, if, uh, make that, that, that discussion efficient as much as possible. Okay, here, uh, everybody is here, okay. We have a gallery view. Okay. Okay. Here. Okay. So we have um six students. Um, let me uh the the introduce uh one by one. Uh, we have a Joel from Uganda. Okay. Yeah. He's from Central Bank of Uganda. We have a Nolana from Bangladesh. Hello. Universities. Yep. Yeah. We have a Sidra from Pakistan, working at the National Database and Registration Authorities. We have a Sakem from Kazakhstan. He's the office of the president. Okay, Kazakhstan. And B Boy from the Philippines, working for NEDA, National Economic Development Authority, in charge of development planning and aid management. And if we have a Yuhi uh, Kuwata from Japan, from the, the local government, Yokohama cities. Okay, so we hope we have a lot of uh, interesting discussion. Um, who wants to start? Uh, maybe uh, Norana, you wanna start? Yeah, okay. Thank you very much uh, to give me such kind of wonderful uh, opportunity to be a part of this discussion. Actually, also my questions, one part is done earlier, but now I wanted to ask like how peripheral peoples or peoples who are living in very rural area or uneducated peoples in Taiwan, uh, how they get the opportunity to this ICD, um, I mean, opportunity? This is my first question. Thank you. This is an excellent question. In Taiwan, broadband access is a human right. 
Indeed, our constitution and constitutional amendment define a state's possibility of delivering services of uh, health, learning, and communication as inalienable, which means that uh, since the, uh, Dr. Uh, Tsai Ing-wen, our president, uh, first presidential term, we've been very much focusing on empowering, even on the top of Taiwan, almost 4,000 meters high. Everyone is guaranteed to have 10 megabits per second, and it's actually both ways. So download 10 megabits, upload at least one megabit for very affordable, just 16 US dollar per month. So even in the very low resource areas, we use microwave and soon maybe low Earth orbit satellites to make sure that everyone gets the basic broadband access. Because we understand if you don't have that uplink, then it's the internet is the same as television. Right. You can watch and download things, but you cannot participate, for example, in this forum. So we need to make sure that this is guaranteed before even entertaining about health or education rights, because telemedicine and telediagnosis and teleeducation builds upon this broadband as human rights. And I make this commitment very publicly, saying if you don't have that access, it's my fault, like personally. Uh, and so I get emails from the Yangming Mountain, for example, when people uh, are at the quarantine center and at that side of mountain, uh, they don't get reception from the five telecom. Uh, they say, oh, it took them uh, half a day to send this email. Minister, you promised Robin's a human right. I'm suffering 14 days of quarantine with no human rights as the email. And then I will call the National Communication Commission. And in two weeks, um, that telecom tower gets set up and they enjoy the broadband rights. Of course, by that time, that man is already out of quarantine, but he made a point of driving back, measuring the speed test and posting it on social media and so on to hold me accountable. So that is the kind of commitment. I see. Okay. Thank so, you. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a human rights, it's a human rights. That is a very impressive and you yes. can act on that. Maybe Sidra, you have some questions? Yeah. Good afternoon. First of all, I'm very glad that I have a chance to ask a question to you. It's my pleasure. Uh, my question for you is, in your point of view, what are some serious threats that technology poses today? And uh, what can government do to deal with these rapidly rising challenges? Sorry, I, I didn't get the last sentence. Uh, can you repeat the, the last part? Uh, 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 in your point of view, uh, what are some serious threats that technology poses today? Uh, threats, okay. Yeah, so uh -huh. how can government do to deal with these rapidly rising challenges? Thank you. So uh, I do believe that in democratic polities, we are all suffering from the infodemic in the uh, public sphere because of the invention of both the addictive touchscreen and the more anti-social corner of social media because a message that uh, makes people feel polarized uh, gets people instinctively click share. To click share is actually easier than clicking comment. Uh, and because of this, uh, this information spread very quickly because it has a higher reproduction value, like a virus, like literally like a virus of the mind, it will share from people uh, to people. And instead of uh, taking anything down, which would be like a, a lockdown. In Taiwan, we don't do takedown. Instead, we face the threat of this information crisis with humor. So we have this idea of humor over rumor, meaning that when we see a trending conspiracy theory or something, uh, we take its RNA, that's to say its elements, and surround it, it in a very cute corner, like with very cute spoke stocks and so on. Uh, and everyone, after seeing this very cute post of dispelling the rumor and laughed about it, uh, well, the potency of the original disinformation disappear. So what I'm trying to get at is that the threat of disinformation can be countered very succinctly uh, by having a very cute spoke stock, uh, the Zong Chai, a Shiba Inu, uh, explaining, for example, uh, that when we're doing physical distance, you really need to keep three Shibas away from one another indoors and outdoor too. Uh, cover your mouth and nose when sneezing uh, and also wear a mask to protect your own face against your own unwashed hands. And these are very catchy. 
uh, once people see it, it's very hard to um, still get mad or outraged when you see uh, mask related disinformation. So it serves as kind of vaccine of the mind when we roll out this humor over rumor campaigns. Yeah. Humor over you, yeah, and also that the, uh, the yes, thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you very much. <laughs> is that okay? Yeah. yeah, maybe Norana maybe wish to follow up about the threat issues. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Thank you very much again. Uh, actually, you discuss this matter, but my supplementary question is that: Have any policies from the government? to protect the misuse of ICT opportunities. Misuse, I wanted to refer here like fake news or threat to cybersecurity or online harassment. Uh, it could be men, women, anything or girls. So have any government policies to protect? That's a really good question. Instead of relying on laws, we rely on the social norms collectively enforced by the threat of consumer sanction. I believe this is the most effective way to counter the systemic issues. One example, during our 2018 referendum, national referendum and mayor election, we discovered that instead of uh, doing campaign donations, many people from outside of Taiwan choose to buy targeted advertisements on Facebook to incite the kind of hate that discourage people to vote or to mislead people on social and political issues during our mayoral election and the referendum. Because of that, the social sector, that is to say the people in the community and the social technologists, they demanded first that our national audit office, the Control Yuan, to publish our campaign donation expenditure report. Previously, you have to go into the building and access it with paper. Mm -hmm. But because of the social sector's insistence, they actually took out the printed paper and crowdsourced the otaku character recognition or OCR, crowdsourcing people to type it back to open data so investigative journalists can look into campaign donation records. And in 2018, they convinced the legislature to force the control yuan to publish as open data the campaign donation expenditure. So because of this social sector's push, we see very clearly for the first time that the social media advertisements are not declared as campaign donations and expenditure, and it's clear for everyone to see. And then the people went to Facebook saying, you have to treat those political and social advertisements the same as how our control yuan treats political campaign expenditure and donations. That's to say, to disclose who placed what advertisement toward which people and to uh, what effect. And also ban foreign people from paying such advertisements because, well, foreign people cannot participate in the domestic campaign donations either. That is to say, it should be the same social norm. But in these norm first responses, note that we did not pass any new law. This is rather the investigative journalists, the people who use those platforms collectively saying, if Facebook abuse democracy, we will not be using Facebook. We will be using the social media that have signed on this counter disinformation accord. And so Facebook very quickly, I believe Taiwan is one, if not uh, the only jurisdiction around that time in 2019, early 2019, to receive the promise and later implementation of honest advertisement during our election session. So the 2020 presidential election is relatively free of this online paid hate speech during election time. So I go into this detail because I believe that the norm set by the social sector outlast any particular administration and actually results in a better response from the economic sector because they don't want to lose the consumers. I see, I see. So in that sense, there are sort of maybe um, kind of that um, people have a kind of social sector or those kind of social entrepreneur IT experts have some kind of like moral obligation that, that to, 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 to make sure the information there is um, they mean, account accountable, and then they they have to make sure that that is a uh, safe, no, for yeah, trustful. Yes. I see. So those are the culture you you have fostered. I see. Um, maybe next question. Who wants to raise? Uh, maybe Yuhi. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Yuhi Kurata from the City Government of Yokohama, Japan. 
I'm very glad to have opportunity to talk to you. And my question is, how uh, can we enhance the people's trust in the government to manage personal information? So uh, let me explain the background of Japan. In 2016, uh, Japan tried to adopt an identification number system that manage all personal information, such as tax, health insurance, and pension to re realize e-government. However, uh, at the moment, at, at uh, this April, still only 28% of uh, citizens own this personal number card in Japan. One of the reasons is a less opportunity to use this number. However, I believe that another reason is that lack of trust in government, such as information leakage or fear of controlled society. So I think uh, Taiwan is very advanced in this field. So that is the reason I would like to ask this question. Thank you. Indeed, in Taiwan, while we do have uh, the paper-based national identification card, we have the electronic health insurance card since 2003. And when in 2003, it was being piloted in Penghu or the Pescadores Islands, uh, that was when SARS or nowadays I should call it SARS 1.0 uh, hit Taiwan, uh, but the IC-based health card proved to be very convenient and successfully enabled the kind of measure that are simply not possible using paper-based cards uh, in the Pescadores Island at that time. So one year after in 2003, everyone in Taiwan also began switching to the IC-based uh, health cards. And I believe that IC-based health card gets this adoption for three reasons. One, because of people's access to the trusted doctors and pharmacists, they see that the doctor and pharmacy have also to use their own card to complete a transaction such as prescribing a uh, some drug from a pharmacy or prescribing a diagnosis. That is to say, if things go wrong, they know who to blame. That's that doctor or that pharmacist yeah. uh, to blame. So, so uh, a accountability trail backed by a real person you trust very important, the first thing. Mm -hmm. And the second thing, to give no trust is to get no trust. So the state need to trust the people to make good use of their own data. So in Taiwan, everyone with the National Health Insurance Express app can download uh, all the, um, I don't know, x-ray scans. I think nowadays even CT scans, diagnosis, of course, the COVID-19 uh, rapid testing or PCR testing records, um, you name it. You can download it on your phone and use some third party application on your phone if you so prefer uh, to enable more uh, creative uses. But the calculation is done on your own phone because people trust their own mobile phone uh, more than the government database. That's the same for everyone <laughs> around all jurisdictions. This trust of citizens to be the controller of their own data is very important. And the third thing is that it also enable public purposes. Uh, and we call it the data collisions or data um, uh, collaboratives. I believe the Japanese term is the info bank. Uh, and so the idea, very simply put, is because you can use the National Health Insurance Card, uh, like my grandma can, can use it to order the mask uh, rationing, or you can use the app also to order to a nearby convenience store. But if you have plenty of mask, uh, and we're talking about last April or so, if you happen to have plenty of mask before the pandemic, then you don't need the daily ration of three uh, pieces per week, but you can save it. Like that's so you can simply not order it. But after a while, it will accumulate as your quota, right? And using the National Health app, you can tell our foreign service to donate your mask ration quota to international humanitarian aid. And so using this app, more than 7 million pieces of medical mask uh, rations are dedicated to international community. Really? Uh, and half of the people choose to remain anonymous, but half of the people get a token of appreciation of Audrey Tang, 17 pieces dedicated to international community. It's like a non-fungible token minted by the National Health Service. And so people use that not just to fulfill one's own need, but once our need is fulfilled, use it for something higher purpose that is to deliver masks to around the world, building a data coalition. And everyone can check the record by their phone very quickly. So they become the controller of their own data and therefore less fear because they don't have to guess and it serves a community purpose. 
I see. <laughs> this is very impressive, no? Yeah, I see. So, hmm, but, but so that I think you have to really make sure that those kind of various different systems would be integrated and also be utilized for motivate people. That yes. I am contributing for something for the society or world. Yeah. So, hmm. <laughs> Yuki san, this is really, yeah, unbelievable and also very, yeah, important. Maybe can I invite other, maybe a student? Maybe second? Yeah, you want to know yeah, how the government works, maybe? Yes, uh, Minister, you mentioned that, uh, that there is a difference between the Minister for IT and Minister for D Digitalization. That's why my question relates to how the government in Taiwan is structured in terms of who is responsible for policy in, to, in the sphere of digitalization, who is implementing uh, is there any separate body for cybersecurity, for telecommunication issue for mass media all of these are related uh, because before um, you mentioned there is a difference for me it was one thing but uh, as you said there is a difference so could you just explain how the government in taiwan structure thank you certainly it uh, stands for information technology so naturally the ministry of science and technology uh, maintains the development uh, of technology, including IT. And also the Ministry of Economic Affairs is currently responsible for the prosperity of the, say, computer uh, digital service sector and so on as a trade like private sector. So these are the main two ministries uh, that relates to IT based um, industry on one side, research and development on the other side. And these are vertical ministries, meaning that uh, they have a kind of commanding structure. However, in the premier's office, in the cabinet office per se, there are nine ministers at large, or I call it horizontal minister. Mm -hmm. Some people call it minister with a portfolio, it doesn't matter. So the nine people are specifically appointed to take care of cross-sectoral issues in an interagency manner. So if the vertical ministers are like the pillars, then we are like the, the ceiling, right? The connector, the bridge uh, that connects them together. And so in our cases, instead of having our own staff, we uh, invite people from all the 12 ministries to join my office as liaison or secondments. And these secondments usually stay between six months uh, to two years or so. Uh, and then they are on a rotating basis. So they go back to their ministry after a while and rotate someone else in. But from each ministry, only one secondment is in my office. And that ensures the diversity of perspective and also ensure that there's no superior and inferior relationship. Even if the National Communication Commission in charge of the uh, broadcasting and telecom operators sent a section chief, actually the most senior section chief, uh, but the Foreign Service sends a section chief here, right? So uh, an advanced uh, bureau chief is in the same ministry, always higher than a section chief. But because they belong to different ministry initially and they join my office in a cross-cutting way, no one is the superior of one another. And we're in a kind of learning circle relationship to one another. So to maximize diversity ensures the inclusion in policy making. I see. Second, do you, do you are you convinced? Uh, <laughs> yes, but thank you. And uh, the second question is relates to the laws because uh, one question is uh, how the government organizes, and second is how it works. And usually, uh, government works in accordance with laws. So, could you just mention some maybe basic or main laws in this sphere? Thank you. Definitely. Um, in Taiwan, we work very closely with the private sector in exploring horizons that are not anticipated by the lawmakers. And it's variously called a experimentation act or simply a sandbox. Now, I understand sandbox means something different in Japan. In Japan, it means a locality, like a municipality uh, that are strategic zones where some regulation may be relaxed. But in Taiwan, it means that uh, a competent authority, usually a ministry, pre-approves a set of six months or 12 months possibility of essentially breaking the law. 
but you have to bring better alternative to the existing law system. So for autonomous driving, uh, self-driving vehicles, including flying ones, uh, for financial services, the FinTech sandbox, and very soon uh, for medical uh, applications and health applications and so on, we have our preordained continental law system uh, like sandbox acts that pre-approves these experimentations. And so after six months, if the people likes it, then of course it becomes new regulations or laws. If people don't like it, well, the risk is bounded. So nobody much gets hurt. So that is how a continental law system improves itself by essentially inviting time bounded and risk bounded experimentations. I see. So again, are you satisfied? Well, you're still kind of <laughs> puzzling. <laughs> Uh, generally, thank you. Maybe later on, if the time allows, maybe I'll get in. Thank you. See, thank yeah. you. Yeah, because I think uh, normally that I mean, ministerial, maybe rivalry also exists. So even if you are seconded from the various ministry in the office, sometimes that some interest from particular ministry may crush, no? So how... Yeah, but, but that's because the numbers of people dominate. If we allow 10 people to join my office from foreign service, mm. then we will become the digital diplomacy unit, right? So, but only one person joined my office. So nobody, no perspective dominate the conversation. This is very important. I and see. the other part is that in addition to the 12 or so ministerial secondment, there's also 11 or so civil society experts. So it's almost half, half. But the career public service uh, always um, have one or two more people. But the idea is that we are still a government organization, of course. But we, if we discover that there are, for example, service design, which does not have a ministry, but it's very important to our vision, then we import people from IDEO, from uh, RCA, uh, from you know the Copenhagen Institute of Design. Uh, into like one service design secondment to my office, but there's no ministry for service design, unfortunately, personally speaking, <laughs> but we still have an expert here. Uh, and so we have experts from the civil society. And I believe your digital agency also do something like that. Uh, the planning access up to 100 people, if I'm not mistaken, are joining as civil society and industrial secondments into the 5,000 people structure in the digital agency. I think it's a really good design. Uh, Professor Rona, if you allow, just uh, would like to question one small qu uh, question. Minister, you mentioned that there was in the slides about the visualizing the executive process. So just uh, could you just shortly answer, is it uh, who put this information? Is it done automatically or some public official? Yes, yes. yes. So uh, our basic idea of open data is publication upon collection. And this is uh, quite radical because it means that everything is opened up before any uh, review from the public service. In the old age of Freedom of Information Act, People can request any information, but a public servant always look at it before it gets out. That's the usual way. However, in our state, it's not like that. We simply say if it's not related to personal information, trade secret, and so on, uh, soon as we collect, for example, one piece of musk is being sold in some pharmacy, we publish that within 30 seconds to open data. If it's updated every 30 seconds, of course, nobody look at it before it goes out. And it encourages people to develop real-time applications, such as the mask availability map, that let people see exactly after 30 seconds uh, how many pieces the people queuing before you purchased. Imagine if someone have to run the FOIA process, then we would not have 100 different applications to visualize this real-time data. But paradoxically, the public service loves this because nobody is to blame if the numbers are wrong because nobody produced those numbers. This is simply machine generated. So if things are wrong, well, we fix the machine, but nobody uh, resigns because it's not passing anyone's review. And the real way to implement this is to implement your procurement contract template that any IT system that has a user visible data input and output field 
need to provide an equivalent API application programming interface for robots. And in your contracts uh, for procurement, you probably already have a clause saying, if you produce only for people with sight, but ignore people with visual impairments, then that vendor could be disqualified for not being accessible enough. I believe Japan has that in your contract template. But in Taiwan, we say uh, robots are a kind of people with blindness. So if you uh, do only human to human system, but you don't speak machine to machine language, you're discriminating against robots and could be disqualified as a vendor. We, we didn't really say that, but that's the effect. So basically any new system are like Lego blocks. If we use the tax paying uh, application, make a API, change some parameter in three day, it begin uh, selling mask changing some other parameter, it begins selling triple, triple stimulus vouchers. After a few changes, it become an SMS uh, QR code producing machine. And after some tweaks, it become a vaccine reservation system. So it means that the API can be uh, hooked into various different ministry system without each ministry having to reinvent the underlying infrastructure or cybersecurity audits and things like that. And so this Lego block like um, design, API first design frees both the public service from the blame of the FOIA machine. And also it frees new procurements so you can work with startups, but still enjoy the bedrock of system integrators work beforehand. Okay, <laughs> he's getting beyond my comprehension, but we really need a really real expert like you who are really able to find out what is the best technical solution no, for the integrated services. Yeah. Maybe, Joel, that as an economist, you have some question you wanted to ask, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you, uh, Honorable Minister. Thank you for the opportunity of giving us to interface with you. Uh, mine is um, I would I would like to talk about the taxation in uh, Taiwan of the big tech companies. Uh, could you kindly comment on how Taiwan has dealt with the challenge of efficiently taxing the foreign big uh, tech companies? Uh, my context is coming from the fact that uh, uh, technology has been a critical uh, factor towards the economic growth of Taiwan. Just like most countries. Um, Taiwan has allowed overseas big tech companies such as Google, Facebook, Twitter, and many others to provide services um, in its territory. Um, the Organization of Economic Development and Economic Cooperation and Development has been concerned about the difficulty faced by countries in efficiently taxing such big tech companies since most of them operate remotely uh, without physical addresses in foreign countries. Um, I wonder how Taiwan has been able to deal with this challenge of efficiently taxing the big tech companies. Well, all of them, the, the big ones, have agreed to set up VAT accounts. So it's uh, practically speaking not a big problem in Taiwan. And the reason why uh, they agree uh, to set up such accounts uh, is that, as I mentioned, there is a strong social, um, let's call it, uh, a social support mm. for the fair taxation and a strong social sanction if it doesn't work like that. Mm. So the government's role is not to invent some new technology. It's simply to make people aware that this kind of, um, I would not call it evasion, um, this kind of circumvention is going on. And then people uh, will feel uh, that we need to rebalance it so that people get the fair uh, taxation and also the fair representation in negotiating with these almost like se semi co governor entities. One example is Uber, who initially did not pay tax and employed people with no professional licenses uh, in 2015. Uh, and in a cross sectoral meeting enabled by the POLIS, P-O-L-I-S technology, everybody feel that fair insurance registration tax is like non-negotiable, including Uber drivers themselves. And so because of this social support and the implicit threat of social sanction, uh, Uber, uh, after just one year, 
agree to commit itself to set up local company. And now it's a local taxi company now, the Q Taxi. And the same law that was crowdsourced to make this possible also made it possible for the local church and temple serving the very remote and rural area to set up their own Uber uh, and taking advantage of this fair representation and insurance and taxation policy. So it's again a social sector led people public private partnership. I see, I see. Thank you. Okay, maybe um, the, there are other questions which may be related to the big companies. Maybe, Vivo, you want to ask? Good afternoon, Minister. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, do you think uh, government should regulate big tech companies such as Google, Amazon, Alibaba, and Tencent? Based on recent news and media reports, there have been increasing concerns globally that these companies have become too powerful and therefore governments must intervene to protect the public on antitrust and data protection issues. Or do you think that big tech companies should self-regulate instead? I think um, the private sector and the public sector exist to empower the citizens, the social sector. And just this idea of social sector is very important because in many jurisdictions, there's no such an idea. People say, oh, there are some MBOs, right? Voluntary sector, the third sector, like it's the smallest one uh, or something like that. Uh, and so just this idea of social sector setting the rules is fundamental. Because when the social sector has good alternative, like in Taiwan, we have the PTT, uh, which is sometimes compared to Reddit, but it's not Reddit. It's um, not a company. Uh, it's open source. It's a student pet project of National Taiwan University running for 25 years now. Uh, and it has no advertisers nor shareholders. So it only responds to the community. It doesn't respond to any for-profit uh, motive. So it doesn't even need to say uh, I'm a social enterprise. It's not even a enterprise. <laughs> it's just an open source group of people. Uh, and so if you have a strong community like this, then you always have a good BATNA uh, when negotiating with the uh, private sector companies. We can always say, you know, the PTT does this brilliantly. So if you do not conform to this or that self-regulation rules, let's just go back to the PTT. Right. So if you can say that to the foreign companies, then that means they will more often than not conform to your local norms because you prove you already have a norm that's set collaborative by the people instead of, you know, just the public sector doing some top down um, policies that are not implemented anywhere domestically because you have a living proof that these policies are there because, it, well, the, the people force us to set this up, right? So this is a lot like trade negotiation. If you have good alignment with what people want, then you can negotiate much more um, deliberately and also much more specifically. I see. Viva, are you convinced? <laughs> Uh, oh, you have additional questions? <laughs> yes, but I have a follow-up question, yeah. somewhat yes. related to the first question. Uh, in the last recent U.S. elections, Twitter and Facebook banned President Trump and other Republican social media accounts. Uh, both uh, social media giants, uh, they tried to justify the ban, saying that uh, they violated community standards and regulations. However, critics say that uh, what transpired was uh, free speech censorship and that the president was banned because of uh, differences in political views. Even some e-commerce platforms have banned several merchants because of uh, similar reasons. Do you think uh, these online companies have the right to censor speech or prevent them from engaging in buying or selling or monetizing from their platforms without due legal process? Well, the oversight board is uh, Facebook's response right to the lack of um, access to justice in actions like this, essentially setting up a private sector court uh, modeled after the court system. Now, this is very interesting because having that process means that we're in a state of overlapping jurisdiction. The private sector asserts its private law, that's to say privilege, uh, on this uh, communication space while the state asserts its own uh, privilege uh, jurisdiction on the same space. And so I think these uh, tensions are resolved not by laws. 
unfortunately, the internet is designed to treat the local laws if they infringe with how the internet end-to-end -end principle works. The internet is designed to route around it as if it's damaged. So always you can find in some corners of the internet that it's impossible for the state to exercise its power to censor. On the other hand, it also means the social media companies are impossible to dominate, to truly monopolize the market if the social sector develop viable alternatives to the uh, more antisocial corners of social media. So both a viable competition to the private sector services, as well as a viable implementation of the civic ideas of communication space outside of state control. These two need to be justified and implemented concurrently in things like the PTT or Wikipedia before we have a reasonable way out of this seemingly zero-sum tension between state power and capital power. Uh, and these spaces are what I call, again, public digital infrastructures. It's like a community park. Uh, it's like a academic campus ground and things like that, only digitally and supported by a different norm than the state's norm or the capitalist norm. But before we develop this and assign a public infrastructure status in national budget, like the budget to encourage research, then it's impossible for people to um, you know, work on this for a long time to provide viable uh, alternative to the advertisement fueled uh, capitalist platforms because of market incentives. So in 2016, for the first time, we classified these digital projects as infrastructure in our infrastructure bill, which previously only pay for things are, that are concrete, like literally made out of concrete. <laughs> and in 2016 special act, we say, no, um, even if it's made of bits, not concrete, it's still essential public infrastructure. And we got a lot of good public infrastructure funded this way that are at arm's length from the state control. I see. Okay. Uh, I think that we still want to keep discussing, but I think uh, because of the time here, we want to also invite the other question from other the, the audience, and then okay. still your students. No, that they can continue asking, okay? Because I saw the raising hand by like um, Mamoon um, Muhammad from Bangladesh. And also I saw that one more person uh, from that the Japanese um, persons who wanted to raise hand, but uh, now it's, um, yeah. But if you want to raise a hand, please raise a function. And then Mamoon, could you speak? Can you show your face? Mamu Mohammed? Okay, the meanwhile, yeah, oh, yeah. Mamu, Mamu is here. Sheikh. Okay, yeah, yes, please, yes, please. Yes, okay, thank you, Sanjay, for giving me the opportunity. It's been a uh, really a pleasure opportunity for me to. You can show your face too, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes I, I see I see Mamun. I see Mamun yes, now. You can see Mamun. Okay, thank you. So, Sanjay, it's a really pleasure for me to see you. Uh, uh, at least after three years. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you, Sanjay. Uh, uh, my question, and uh, uh, especially thanks to Honorable uh, Minister to uh, raise the uh, fantastic issue and a really time-bound issue. But my question is the experience between developed and developing country is not same, especially in digital. Rather, in some in some cases. If you compare the developing countries, it increases the digital divide. Mm -hmm. So, especially in countries like Bangladesh, uh, even maybe India, Pakistan, or this sort of countries, the, there is a phobia. So, well, there is people always that their mindset, especially from the perspective of uh, service provider and service receiver. So, for example, if you incorporate some services through digital device to internet, it creates some third parties for their business because the most people or the people who are getting this service, they are not quite, uh, they, are not, uh, they, they don't have sufficient knowledge or access to this service, so that they need to hire someone, some uh, uh, agency or some people. So do you think this it sometimes increase the division among the people, especially the those who have and have not? And another question is, there is, in your abstract, you mentioned this 
to minimize the gap between rural and urban for information digital technology especially in rural and urban they have a separate lifestyle separate because if you want to see a place it has some separate uh, lifestyle and urban it is separate lifestyle so how we can minimize this in just only through information because their lifestyle is different people are different profession is different and because some people are living rural because they like to live as rural so thank you minister for uh, for for giving this opportunity Thank you. Thank you. Very good questions. Just to check my understanding. Uh, the first question is really about how to make sure that people overcome uh, their um, kind of existing disadvantages when it comes to digital competence uh, and the infrastructure required so that there is a kind of positive attitude uh, toward digital transformation. And the second uh, is almost a flip of that. Once we get people digitalized, uh, it disrupts its uh, cultural norms because everybody watches Netflix or something, right? Uh, and then the lifestyles get disrupted and the local culture and norms too uh, and, and become much more global. But also it means that people lose something of their identity when it comes to their local culture. Did I get that right? Okay. True, true, right. True, true. right. Right. Okay. Yeah, so. Same, um, yeah. Uh -huh. Sorry. Yeah, but at the same time, Mamu is talking about because that the fundamentally there are kind of the, the dif difference among developed country and then developing countries on the maybe that the the, the 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 level of technology and also human resources. So that, that because maybe people are very much students are very much impressed with how, how Taiwan is a very mature. Everybody is so committed to the social and contribution. And so the IT sector people or even, yeah. So that, uh, so uh, uh, that I think maybe many people feel like that, that those kind of culture or social basis may not exist or still premature. Or at the same time, technically speaking, there are lots of maybe differences between advanced and then less advanced countries. So he is struggling, no? That uh, how, how, how those things can be, yeah. Uh, yeah, th yeah, yes, yes. That that's my uh, interpretation of a kind of path out of the current like have nots uh, and the uh, more disadvantaged uh, countries and so on. And and this includes some very technical points. Like if you are on a small island in the Pacific Ocean, then the internet connectivity is expensive. For example, if you are a landlocked country, that means that it's simply not able uh, to get good negotiations price on internet peering and things like that. So there are some like real economic factors at play here. That's certainly true. So um, my, my answer is first, um, Taiwan did not start like this. When I was born in the early 80s, of course, it's true that we have personal computers, but we're, we were at a time still under the martial law. Uh, there was no freedom of uh, assembly, uh, of uh, getting the social organizations, uh, even the uh, co-ops cannot uh, take any political party um, attitude. Uh, they have to say we're just working on environmental protection uh, or things like that. So it's not a very free political landscape uh, in, in the time I was born. Right. So, uh, I mean, we, we were there. It's not like we're always describing uh, yeah. digital democracy. OK, mm -hmm. so so I think that the point is that in Taiwan, even during the day of the martial law, even during the day that we did not have broadband as a human right, there is a consistent thread of the social sector, especially after the earthquake, the great earthquake of September 21. What used to be different religions like this church and that Buddhist uh, religion uh, temple, they start to work together like brothers and sisters because of that great earthquake. Uh, and I believe the same thing has happened in Japan, actually many times over actually. So what I'm trying to say is that I'm not saying that disaster um, is a requirement, but, but it is quite true that a common urgency, not necessarily a disaster, bends people together. And the social solidarity that you learn from it then powers the necessary ladder of expertise that leads people out of the have-nots mindset. 
We can see the same, for example, with how Taiwanese people insisted that our country uh, dedicate a uh, spare medical mask to the international community, even when we're relatively still short on mask last year. And in turn, of course, we get very generous uh, dedications and donations from, uh, well, even Lithuania, but also Japan and so on on vaccines this time mm -hmm. and so on. So this is kind of circulation of goodwill. And this is because we're facing the common urgency of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So my point is that to discover your common urgency with the international community, it could be climate action. Right? It could be any of those SDGs. Uh, to discover the common urgency is to get connected to a much more uh, positive sum community instead of engaging purely in zero sum communities. I believe that is one possible way out. And also the local cultures and norms. I believe in Taiwan, as we have more than 20 national languages, if you count the sign language also, and many of which are indigenous. So we care very much about the equity of the indigenous culture that they own, the kind of sovereignty, the First Nation status when we bring technology to, to them. Uh, and so this idea of uh, transculturalism, I believe, is very important. When we legalized, for example, I understand this is a sensitive topic, marriage equality uh, in uh, a couple of years back, we made sure we did not change the civil code. The civil code stays untouched. We just made a new act and hyperlink this uh, new relationship uh, to the rights and duties by law. But we did not mention anything about the in-law. The families and families do not wed when the two same-sex persons perform uh, this, uh, this uh, Article 2 relation uh, ceremony. Uh, and so because of that, it doesn't touch the family structure or the social norm. And this is what allowed the social norm to continue to thrive without getting disrupted by this like well-connected digital native idea of uh, gender equity-based marriage equality. So if, if you understand what I'm saying is this uh, bylaws is just the rights and duties. The in-laws, the family relationships is to be honored. We must never let one side triumph the other. Otherwise the earthquake will not raise our island, it will sink our island. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have uh, maybe a few minutes uh, only remaining before the Minister uh, Tang uh, have to uh, the, 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 the leave. But I think we have uh, two uh, maybe questions, so the two Kobayashi-san. So may I invite both of you to have a very brief questions and then uh, Audrey can maybe yeah, answer yeah, in an integral manner. Yeah. So Kobayashi-san first, Hikaru-san first. And then Azumi-san, yeah. Okay, uh, Minister Tan, thank you very much to, to have the opportunity to talk to you. Uh, I'm from medical uh, policy, so the, my question is tied to the medical. The, you made marvelous achievement under the COVID-19 owing to digital technology. Which medical domains do you still see issues in Taiwan and the, the, where the, the area you could get over the liberalizing digital technology? That okay. is my question. Okay. Thank you. Then let me invite Azumi-san also. Could you unmute yourself? Yeah. Thank you very much for, for your very best lecture. My question is, uh, how do you think you can better use the power of digital in an authoritarian country? Authoritarian country. Yes. I see. Okay, these are two <laughs> very important mm -hmm. questions. Yeah. Right, we, we can run like two hour seminars <laughs> on each question <laughs> and I'm doing this in two minutes. Okay, right, so um, to the second question, um, I was born in an authoritarian country, right? So <laughs> Taiwan was quite authoritarian. Uh, and because of this, I believe we have a unique glimpse into this question's answer, which is simply that we see democracy as a kind of social technology. Yeah. If we think of democracy as not a time-honored condition or something, but rather a technology like semiconductor design, uh, if you vote for president, that's uploading three bits per person every four years, not a lot of bandwidth. Yeah. But if you vote uh, every other day on the online petition, 
then using new voting method like quadratic voting, you can get a lot more preferences out. That's like kilobytes of transmission as compared to just bits of transmission. So thinking about democracy, not as some uh, sacred religion or ritual, but rather as a useful social technology that everybody can improve. I believe that is how we slowly and now surely walked out of authoritarianism by thinking about even our constitution uh, or our referendum act as piece of social technology <laughs> that people can design together. So that's a very brief answer to your uh, great question. Uh, and the first question about the medical domains, I believe in Taiwan, we're now working in the kind of domains before the medical. That is to say, uh, I think it's called preventative uh, medicine or simply uh, health domain. So before people get sick, people want to know how they can change their behavior for the better of their family and themselves. And during the pandemic, this is doubly necessary because one person's uh, bad public health um, habit becomes, uh, well, a public disaster. <laughs> well, now we're, we're, we're back to like 20, 30 cases a day. It's not feel like a disaster anymore, <laughs> but, but it was, uh, the memory was still fresh is what I'm saying. So uh, I believe uh, a good data collaborative is not just about pulling together must to donation. It is also pulling together good behavior that encourage people to drink more, for example, when they exercise under high heat, uh, for example, to encourage people to refill their bottles rather than buying a lot of plastic bottles uh, when they uh, do outdoor activities together, about pu push notifications to change the behavior so that when people exercise, they're also reducing carbon footprint uh, and so on and so forth. And because if it serves the public purpose, then it's of course fair to everyone involved but it has also to be fun, like a Pokemon Go game. Uh, it need to be fun. So if it's fast, it's fair and it's fun, then it has real potential for behavior changing. And once that is designed with participatory design, then nobody gets sick, right? <laughs> if they do this very regularly, at least for a longer time. Uh, and then we don't need to go into the medical domain that quickly is my answer. Is that okay? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Typically, I think we need more time in really interacting and discussing and learning. But I think uh, that uh, because of the time, I think for the discussion session with Minister Tang, maybe let's yeah, that, uh, conclude this. So um, I will have a wrap up later that uh, after she leaves. But uh, for, we really would like to thank you very much for Audrey for spending such an important time and then share with us how the Taiwan social sector, which include both public and private sector, no, have progressed over time and then committed yeah, to working together. And technology is a part of this. So that is a very strong culture. Yeah. President Tanaka, do you want to say something at the last moment? Well, <laughs> I, I only want to uh, thank uh, Audrey. Uh, thank you for your great uh, uh, talk. Yeah. OK. Thank you. So let's yeah that, that say thank you very much. Show the mm -hmm. Audrey for that, that, yes. that long ride and then prosper. Yes. And thank you, thank you very you. much. We really Before appreciate. And prosper. Thank you. Thank you. Arigato gozaimashita. Thank Arigato. you. We will see you again. Yeah. Yes. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Please, please still could connect it. No. Yeah. So thank you very much for everybody. And then among the students, yeah. Um, if you have something your thought you want to share like a Sidra or, uh, I don't know, Yuhi or uh, Saken or uh, Joy or whatever. Yeah, if you have something you want to share after discussing with um, Audrey, that we, we are also welcome. Yeah, maybe we have a few minutes. <laughs> Reflection? Do you see some, um, maybe, that the Taiwan's kind of culture, special culture has been fostered through the histories. And uh, she mentioned that the Taiwan was also authoritarian regime. And then, but there are kind of people who try to commit in social improvement and then technologies become a part of this. But um, um, I really feel like it's a very important thing. If you have any thinking to you want to share together, that would be very much appreciated. No? Okay. 
Okay, then uh, maybe because the we I think we had a very much good time uh, with um get, really getting idea and a strong vision and the impressive uh, maybe achievement that uh, Taiwan has been making uh, under the Audrey. So uh, let me go to this final maybe wrap up session. So um, I have to say that uh, we really learned a lot from today's discussion and also active participation from all of you. And uh, I think we are living in a digital revolution, age of digital revolution, and then current crisis, pandemic accelerate this trend. But I think we had a really important time to, to learn together. And I think, let me say three, three, three takeaways which we learned from Audrey. First is that uh, uh, we have learned the model of people-centered co-creative democratic governance in the, in the age of digitalization. I think she talked about many times social sector, which covers both public and not the private sector citizens, having a shared, maybe uh, the same common, maybe goal. She said a social emergency, common emergency is a driver for moving people, no? So I think we feel like at the, past government, like a president, like Abraham, Abraham Lincoln said about the government of the people, by the people, for the people. But I think it's important that we will be working also government with the people. I think that is a very important message she gave us. Uh, second, at the same time, uh, for this model to work, uh, all of us may need to change the mindset. So the government have to maybe change how to communicate with the citizens and also citizens must also change toward much more active engagement in making contributing societal engagement so revolution should not be just limited to the technology but also maybe mindset have to be changed then lastly uh, to conclude uh, in this digital age like you i think young people who must lead societies and countries and the world towards a better society, no? So Mr. Tang herself showed that the, the model by herself, she's a really great outstanding model in this regard. So how can we foster these young leaders like her and who is good at technology and also with a really motivation for inclusiveness, innovativeness. So what kind of new capabilities needed? So I think today's discussion made me really rethink and reconfirm the important mandate also the institution like us, GRIPS has as an educational and research institution. So we must continue working hard to nurture young global leaders and conduct quality policy research which contribute to the achievement of SDG. So uh, I hope uh, we had a very uh, good inspiration for individually and we can bring back for our that. Uh, that the life and also that the organization or society and the countries. So I really thank you so much for your uh, participation and also all the students in participating for this session very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shenzhen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Shenzhen.